What's going on, ladies and gents? Robert Sykes, KetoSavage.com, and I'm back at you with part two episode with Dr. Anthony J. We talk about the hunting recap we had this past weekend. We're at the Sykes Family Farm. We had a great time, harvested several deer and wild hogs. Then we dove super deep into uh, hormones. We talked about uh, his book, The Estrogen Generation. We talked about uh, all the estrogens that we are subjected to throughout our environmental factors and just day-to-day -day lives and how to hedge against that. Um, so thoroughly enjoy the podcast. Always a pleasure having Anthony here. Uh, we'll have to do it again every year because we just have such a good time. So uh, without further ado, sit back, relax, learn something, and enjoy the conversation with Dr. Anthony J. And we are back. Anthony J, part two. <laughs> here we are, man. How are you? Yeah, doing good. Good, good. We, we just got back. We're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about estrogens on this podcast. We talked about my genetics mm -hmm. on the last one, but I really feel like we gotta dive into the farm recap since we just got back from the trip there. Um, so, what do you think, man? This is your third oh, time at the farm. It's amazing. It's the best. Yeah, it's paradise. Somewhere around three thousand acres, right? Yeah, it's like thirty six hundred, thirty seven hundred in total. Mm -hmm. It's been it's kind of split up a little bit, but the the bulk of it's right there. Um, it's been in my family for four or five generations now. So yeah. very fortunate to have that at my fingertips yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's amazing. You get up there, you go up this long driveway, it's a gate. So it's real private. So I'm right on a river. So it's really tranquil, you know, and pine trees everywhere. But you guys have some nice little cutouts, you mm -hmm. know, some fields that are open. The deer love those. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's got trails all throughout and the hunting this year was phenomenal, man. I mean, it was last year too. We did even better last year, but we had five guys last year. So last year we had Brandon Scott, which who, who was there this year, yeah, myself and yourself. And then we also had Danny Vega and uh, Mike Munsell last year. Mm -hmm. Those two didn't make it this year. They were supposed to. They were supposed <laughs> to. Slackers. <laughs> Slackers. We had, we had to carry their weight, pull their weight for them. Yeah. So last year we shot 21 hogs, I think. Yeah. 21 or 22, something insane from crazy. a hog standpoint. We didn't kill as yeah. many deer last year, though, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. This year the deer were all over. The hogs were a little further out. It's yeah. because it was really dry. It was a strange year. I mean, yeah. the bogs that normally hold the hogs were pretty dried out. I think last year there was so much more water that the river had gone up. Since it's right there on the river, a lot of the sloughs were underwater. So mm -hmm. it kind of pushed all the hogs to higher ground. So we were hunting a more concentrated area where there was pig activity last year mm -hmm. uh which, we still got we yeah. still got a bunch i mean what did we get again seven yeah i think seven hogs all together mm -hmm. yeah so they're they're there it's fun to you know go after those wild pigs and man they're everywhere you should see the forest you know it's just all shredded up uh they're rooting around just ripping things up i don't think people realize that don't hunt or don't have land how much damage wild mm -hmm. hogs can act. i mean they, they wreck havoc on everything man like mm -hmm. we don't really have any you know, agricultural crops, crops there. We got the pine plantation, but I mean, the ground is just totally decimated from mm -hmm. where the hogs have been. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And they're out competing the deer with the acorns and things like that. And you know, I'm, I cut up probably about a hundred pounds of hog meat. I don't butcher the whole pig when I, when we take out these wild pigs, but I take the best cuts of meat for sure. And I'm excited about it, man. I'm going to do some like wild hog sausage and, mm -hmm. And you've, of course, got a bunch of deer that you, we butchered up all together as a team. What did we get for deer again? Remind me. I think we got five deer total. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get any deer. You and Brandon pulled the weight on the deer. I got the mm -hmm. hogs, but mm -hmm. y'all were kind enough to, to give me all the deer meat. So I've yeah, got a man. freezer full of deer now. <laughs> so, yeah, we uh, we took those out. We brought them to the farmhouse. We processed all that, did all of our own processing. And I don't know what my cooler size is. Probably like a 55 quart or something like that. But the whole mm -hmm. thing was plum full of venison. So... That, yeah. that's, a, that's a positive for sure. Doesn't get any better yeah. in quality meat than that. Yeah, in Minnesota, where I'm from, you can shoot unlimited deer. So there's, you know, obviously for me, at least with the bow and arrow, obviously for me, I'm not hard pressed for deer. I can go out in the winter, especially when they hit the food plots and just mm -hmm. take as many deer as I want. Like, for example, last year I got five. The year before I got seven. Wow. And we eat the whole, you know, we, we go through about six of them, my family. Yeah. Well, deer, I mean, there's so much... I don't know, like it's so lean, mm -hmm. especially the deer down here. You're talking mm -hmm. about the deer in Minnesota having a lot more fat on them than the ones here. They're just so lean here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, you get such a broad spectrum of cuts of meat. I mean, we got took the back straps out. Obviously, we make those mistakes. We had tenderloins. Every deer that we killed, we cut out the tenderloins that night and ate mm -hmm. those on the fire, mm -hmm. on the fire, like within an hour of the deer, you know, eating. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, so, like, it's pretty oh, yeah. cool to have that, that fresh of meat. Well, it's also cool, man. You really do live the keto life and the 
the you know the high protein high fat diet we we eat pretty much straight carnivore Mm -hmm. on this trip i mean except for jalapeno poppers with bacon wrap stuffed mushrooms and some stuffed mushrooms i mean we literally had steak keto bricks burgers yep keto brick bricks uh different flavors man they're good um yeah fish brandon brought some ocean fish which is really good you know? I never really had much ocean fish. So I was kind of unexpecting with that, but that was super tasty. Oh, and like we had some fancy, like garlic herb butter, and we just mm-hmm. pan seared those fish and that. We had mm-hmm. what? Well, we have rockfish. Yeah, uh, we call the rockfish it's striper. Striper. For people in New England. <laughs> and then uh, what else we had? We had, we had some Spanish, Spanish mackerel, mackerel that you're not I'm such not a fan, a fan. of, no, <laughs> but I thought it was pretty good. It's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes real fishy. Just imagine like a stinky fish market. Yeah. You know, like. And and a really hot day. That's what Spanish mackerel tastes like. <laughs> um, I guess if you put enough butter on it, anything's good though, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you want to do Spanish mackerel, the problem is they're really bony, they're very mushy, and they taste really fishy. If you want to cook Spanish mackerel, you should put them on a cedar plank. Mm, yeah. And then bake it. And then when you take it out, you throw out the fish and eat the plank. Okay, that's that's good. That's good. <laughs> Rules of wisdom there. I don't think Brandon would agree though. <laughs> well, they make a, like you know the Patagonia clothing brand. Mm-hmm. They started getting into canned food products here recently. So they've got like mm. they're delicious, man. Like they've got these uh, like canned mussels, canned oysters. They've got canned mm. sardines, uh, and they've got Spanish mackerel as one of mm. their canned food of items. Of course, they do. and it's pretty good, man. Like I yeah. like it. But uh, so that was the only other time I've had Spanish mackerel apart from this trip. But I will say I agree with you in like the the texture. It's much more mushy than the mm-hmm. flakiness that we were getting from the striper. So yeah, striper is amazing. Everybody who likes fish pretty much agrees with that if they try fresh striper. And then he had spade fish too. So a lot yeah. of good varieties of fish. A lot of amazing meats that we had. And, and then, then we had duck too. You you duck, went duck yeah. hunting two mornings. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, for got, people that are obsessed with ducks, I shot up couple different varieties man i shot some hooded mergansers which mm-hmm. is pretty unexpected and very cool shot some gadwalls ma- uh, mallards no wood ducks i was yeah. surprised i saw like 40 of them and several of them flying overhead when i was hunting mm-hmm. but yeah exactly and the pond that i was planning to hunt was dried up that was the mm-hmm. main problem this year so i was hunting a fairly large body of water on the property which i will uh, usually it's better to hunt a small body of water Otherwise, the ducks just kind of land haphazardly all around the property. So they're on the body of water. The bigger the body of water, the harder it is. Mm-hmm. Man, still fun. Yeah, it was, it was a good spot, and man. And then we got stuck, or you guys got stuck in the mud while I was out hunting <laughs> yeah. at one point. <laughs> Tell people that was, about that. That was Saturday, so the last day, Brandon and I, he had already tagged out on deer. And I'm like, well, shoot, we've already done all the processing. If we get a deer right now, it's going to have to go back and, and process again. So I'm not going to mm-hmm. shoot a deer unless it's a, a big deer. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just... We're looking for pigs. We just started driving around on the property with this rental side by side that we got. Um, hopefully, the rental company's not listening to this podcast, but uh, we took care of it. We took care of it. But we're driving and we hit, you know, go through several mud puddles, no issues. And then there's this one that looks like any other mud puddle. Oh, and it just rained. It had just yeah. rained the night that night. And uh, <laughs> we had hit that and we just sank, man. We bottomed down, hit the skid plate, and we were spinning wheels and we got like 45 minutes of daylight left at this point and it's a three hour walk back to camp if we have to walk back to camp so we walked oh, back to this oh, fallen down barn and we we salvaged they had like a roll of wire wire mesh uh, a tire some four by four chunks and then we just started digging and cramming stuff underneath tires and i pushed like hell and hoped that we were getting out um and we got out. I mean, it was it was a close oh call for gosh. sure, but we just got hilarious. it. Uh, so <laughs> I felt good about it. Also, I, I came back, and it was dark because I had just finished the evening hunt, and nobody was back, you know? And I was surprised because I knew you guys weren't really hunting. Mm-hmm. You are just out driving around. And then 30 minutes later, you guys come back, and you're just covered in mud. People yeah. should check out your newsletter because you just released the picture of it. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah, I was totally covered. In the man. mud. Yeah. Yeah, I was... Uh, it's nasty mud, man. Oh, like yeah. It's like quicksand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, I don't know, stuff like that is what memories are made of, you mm-hmm. know? So, like, mm-hmm. I'm glad that we got it unstuck because if we hadn't, it'd have been that three-hour drive back. They might have to take a tractor out there and hope to get it unstuck in right. the middle of the night. It would just yeah. been a nightmare. Right. But uh, it all worked out. Yeah, they were, I mean, you guys were on the other side of the place, and there's yeah. no other way around. But, yeah, it was a great trip, man. Thanks for bringing me in. Yeah. 
from Brandon. I'm, I know for sure he's a super, he super appreciates the hunt. Well, this is his experience. second year. This is your third year there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He had a thermal scope last year. So you got a thermal oh, scope this year. And for that people that cool. don't know, cause I, I didn't really know about this. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a pretty traditional hunt in the sense that I use a bolt action rifle with a traditional mm-hmm. reticle scope, nothing fancy. Mm-hmm. And then y'all come with these thermal scopes mm-hmm. that literally illuminate anything that has any heat put heat off. Signature. Um, so like, you know, you obviously can't shoot deer at night. That's illegal. But like for hogs or something, we're trying to manage the population. Mm-hmm. You just simply scan the horizon. And mm-hmm. if there's any animal within, you know, 50 yards, depending on the lay of the land, it'll light up like a freaking neon sign. It's amazing. And you can identify what it is and you can see if you've got a clean shot. And if, you know, it's hogs or something that you can legally kill at night, mm-hmm. it's just that's the way to do it, man, because you get much closer. Mm-hmm. You can just know with much more confidence what your line of sight is and the the clearness of the shot and you put a well-placed shot on them and they don't even know that you're there. Right. Um, At it's lights it's, out. Yeah. It's a different experience. It's like a literally a, being on a different planet when you're looking through the thermal and it's pitch black. You, you move your head away from that scope and you see pitch black. Yeah. Put your head back in. Everything's lighting up all different, you know, you can change the settings and make different colors and all kinds of things, but it's pretty cool. You see birds in the trees, even they're like little heat balls. Yeah. I mean, you see everything you've seen, mm-hmm. like you were seeing mice scurry mm-hmm. around, you mm-hmm. see raccoons, you see possums, you mm-hmm. see, we saw a ton of armadillos. Yeah. Um, you yeah. see deer. I mean, you were getting like within 10 yards of deer Just with crazy, a thermal. crazy at um, night, how you can walk up on them. Yeah. 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 It's and, and the deer. It's beautiful because they got such a long neck. It's very easy to tell if it's a deer. It's not yeah. like, oh, is that a hog or is that Those a deer? ears are looking at you, big old yeah. ears. Yeah. Um, it's crystal clear. And I, f- I filmed it too for people that are interested. Eventually, I'll put it out on my YouTube channel. But my thermal has a unique capa- capability to record video, mm-hmm. which most of them don't. Um, and I'm going to be doing some coyote hunting with that thing too later this winter. So. I'll be getting use out of it. <laughs> well, between last year and this year, y'all both have convinced me I need to invest mm-hmm. in a thermal scope for sure. And yeah. I'll mount that on top of my AR or something. That'll be my Stay dedicated tuned. pig rifle. Stay tuned next um, year. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's crazy what you can see with that thing. I mean, you just, you gain a, a much deeper respect for the wildlife out there because you're like, wow, this is, I mean, you see much more of it than you would otherwise, you know? It's even better than the daytime. Honestly, if you're looking through a thick grove of trees in the daytime, you don't see the animals if they're in there. Mm-hmm. Like if there's a three deer in there, you don't really see them. And I mean, if it's really thick or if they're flagging at that point, it's too late because they've already started moving. Well, yeah, but with the uh, thermal, you just scan through the, it, it, it just shows the heat. So you, it actually goes right through those leaves and things. And that heat jumps out at you. It's pretty mm-hmm. cool. It's a really interesting. Thing. Well, first thing in the morning, last thing at night when I'm hunting, you know, a stand or something over a clear cut, there were several times where I could see deer, mm-hmm. but it was so, you know, quick and so faint that it's like, I think there's a deer there, but I don't know. I don't know enough to confidently make a shot on mm-hmm. it for sure. Mm-hmm. But with that thermal, if I'd had a thermal, mm-hmm. it'd been, you know, black and white, literally. I would be able mm-hmm. to tell, okay, there's mm-hmm. a deer right there. There's three deer right there. Yeah. Um, I have a clear shot, yes or no. It's just a uh, cool technology. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> makes things more of a safeguard. You know if you got a good shot or not. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, it was an awesome trip, man. Awesome trip indeed. Yeah. I don't think people realize that like, most people that are familiar with you see all of your genetic work, your book, Estrogen Generation. Mm-hmm. They see all this science background. Mm-hmm. They don't really assume that you're this hardcore, devout hunter. Mm-hmm. And like, I get you out in the woods, the farm, and it's like, you don't even talk about the genetics of this stuff. I mean, you're, you're like a kid in the candy store, man. Like, yeah. you're literally, you know, you got like 15 GoPros strapped mm-hmm. to you, and you take <laughs> off in the woods, and you're like gone. Yep, yep, yep. It's pretty cool, man. It's cool to see you living your passion with the hunting. Mm-hmm in an environment that is very conducive to living that passion. I don't mm-hmm. feel like a lot of people have that. I was talking to Brandon about that the other morning. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you got to figure out what your passion is in life and then just double down on it. So it's cool to see you do that, man, with the hunting. Oh, yeah. I love hunting. I love being healthy, I like having my family stay healthy. And they kind of go yeah. hand in hand. Like the more you yeah. know about health and learn about nutrition, the more it's okay. I need to eat quality sourced meat, mm-hmm. higher protein foods, higher quality dietary fat foods and remove a bunch of carbohydrates mm-hmm. and you know when, when you realize that hunting just kind of comes naturally because it's like it doesn't get any higher quality food than that mm-hmm. and you get to have the ownership of sourcing your own food so you feel good about it and it's just i, I freaking love it man it's, it's a magic in heaven yeah i mean i didn't start hunting until i was 12 years old and my family does not hunt i had to learn it on my own but you know if people don't know how to hunt but they're interested in it because you honestly save a lot of money I mean, I have a lot of 20, 30 year old clients that say, look, I can't afford 
to buy a, a whole cow or a half a cow or this expensive grass fed meat, you get a $20 deer license. If mm-hmm. you're a resident of a state, most states, you know, have a very reasonable priced deer license and you can buy additional doe tags. Yeah. Like I just got a deer license in Wisconsin and that was 130 bucks because I'm not from Wisconsin. Right. But even that, it's like you shoot a deer, that's, that's way more than 130 bucks worth of meat in my opinion. Totally. But they give you an additional free doe tag. So you, now you've got a deer plus a doe. So you can shoot two does or a buck and a doe. I mean, that's a lot of meat. And then you can keep buying more doe tags for 20 bucks a pop, even as a non-resident. I'm not even from Wisconsin. You can do that. And if you're new to the sport, um, you can get copper bullets. That's what I recommend. I recommend just get a 30 odd six, you know, copper bullets. They're called Barnes bullets. Like you go out in your barn, you get your sheep in your barn, Barnes bullets. And that way you don't put a bunch of lead in your meat, you know, um, that's a great place to start. It's not, you know, every state's got deer. Yeah. <laughs> you can go into your state. The meat's really good. So for me, recommend it. It's like I'm, I'm a resident of Arkansas. So for me, for 25 bucks, mm-hmm. that covers six deer. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the zone to like where we were hunting. I could kill four deer, but statewide I get six. Right. But that $25 general sportsman license also covers any small game. So squirrel, turkeys. rabbit, turkey, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to buy additional duck stamps if I want to do duck hunting. Mm-hmm. But I get all that for twenty five bucks. I mean, that yeah. that's better than any deal you're gonna get in the big box supermarket for meat for sure. Yeah. Now the the caveat to mm. hunting being a cheaper option for procuring food is when you get into it, you start mm-hmm. become passionate about it. So you gotta get like the all the hunting camo gear, mm-hmm. all the mm-hmm. gun, you all can. the scope. You don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, you don't you have can. to. But like you go to that rabbit do. hole and you wind up losing money. To. You do. Um, but it's I by do. choice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I love it, man. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, man, let's talk about some of the, this uh, estrogen generation stuff. So, like, we Go talked on. a lot about. Uh, actually, this is going to be super interesting for me because, you know, we got a baby on the way, mm. and mm-hmm. the last podcast we did was all about the genetic aspect. So we looked at all my genetic data and what that could predispose before. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to do crystals. We're going to have her mm-hmm. do the twenty three and me, and then look at her data. Yep. But with regard to the environmental factors from an epigenetic standpoint, I think I didn't, I don't even think I really realized the significance of epigenetics until I started talking with you. Mm -hmm. But then when I did, it's like, damn, people Mm -hmm. don't even think like people just, they throw up, you know, what their genetic code is. And they're like, okay, it's just in my family. Mm -hmm. They don't realize how much of an impact their day-to-day actions really have on their offspring. And then their offspring's offspring. Right. Like it's like a third generational thing, right? Like what I'm doing now, at least is going to pretty much directly impact my kids, kids, kids Mm -hmm. for the most part. And like, when you realize that it's like, you know, you have to take responsibility and take some ownership and like mm-hmm. try and set your, your further generations up for success. So yeah, man, when let's, they let's dis- dive into that, man. Well, yeah, they, when they discovered epigenetics, it was actually through the, the famine, the Dutch famine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was back in around world war two, the Nazis had kind of cut off the food supply in the Netherlands. And so of course the women that were pregnant, the babies came out smaller. Mm-hmm. But that's expected. They were starving. Um, but what was not expected was around like the 1980s or something, the babies of those babies came out smaller, mm. you know? And, and they said, well, that's not genetic, right? Because you're not passing on, like your genes don't change that quickly. They have the same genes basically as people that were eating plenty of food and, and growing, you know, six foot tall and 200 pounds or whatever. Um, so then they started researching and that's how they discovered, um, you know, the epigenetic changes. So it's, the analogy I like to use just so people understand epigenetics is <clears throat> musical notes. So if you've got a song, you've got lines, black lines on a staff, a piece of paper, just imagine some black lines and then you got your little dots, right? Those are the mu- musical notes. And think of Mary had a little lamb, mm-hmm. right? Like da, 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 da. those single notes, you can draw that on a piece of paper. That's your DNA. Mm-hmm. I can give you that piece of paper. Now you've got that song. You can play that song. It's no problem. Very simple. You can pass that on, et cetera. And sure, you can change it a little bit here and there, if, especially if it's a long song. I mean, our DNA is 4 billion base pairs, you know? So, of course, mutations happen, and you know. But the point is, you've got this melody, but if you add notes on top of those notes, like you think of chords, you still have the same melody, but now you've got chords, right? Now you've got a more complex song. That's epigenetics. The chords are epigenetics. Mm. So the DNA is still there. It's still the same thing. But now you've got these additional chords and complexity, and those change dramatically. You can change those 
within six weeks, for example, if you dramatically improve your hormone profile or your insulin, you know, insulin growth factor changes. In fact, during the Dutch hunger winter, <clears throat> that's the first epigenetic mark that they discovered was ins- insulin growth factor. Mm-hmm. So if you've got high blood sugar all the time, you're basically downgrading your genetics via epigenetics. And this is kind of like, like when you start looking at gestational diabetes, like that's coming mm-hmm. into play with this on a profound it's note. predisposing people even yeah. more to obesity, diabetes, uh, infertility goes down. So in animal studies, what they do is they like, here's the most striking example. I think they had a study with mother rats and they only gave them, Oh, let me give you the fish study first, because the fish study was interesting. I mean, they have so many studies that were so crazy with this epigenetics. They had fish that female fish that were going to lay eggs. They gave them one exposure to BPA, this plastic chemical. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also did one with birth control, I think. And then they had a, a control with just pure water. And fish are great because they have giant amounts of eggs, right? So they have all these little tiny minnows and you can count them. And, and then what they did was they tracked the generations. Now, they didn't keep the female fish in um, or, or the eggs in BPA. They just gave the mother, the mother fish, if you want to call it that, uh, they gave her one BPA exposure. They didn't keep it in there. They flushed it out, gave her pure water, all this kind of thing. Well, less offspring. She had less offspring. Not a crazy amount, but definitely less. <clears throat> but what was even crazier is those offspring were grown in pure water. From, you know, these minnows, basically. Like they, mm-hmm. they weren't mm-hmm. yep. they, they weren't never exposed. Were exposed never were exposed. But that next generation had even less offspring and then the third and fourth. Mm. And the reason they do four generations usually, and then they stop the study, is because if, if you only did three generations, you could say, well, the mother probably had her stem cells, her, her egg cells exposed. And then if, you know, in the case of rats or something, when they're pregnant, um, you can imagine if you give a female rat that's pregnant, a BPA exposure, well, then the mother's getting it, but also the baby inside the womb is getting it. And also the stem cells from that baby are getting, so you can see how maybe three generations could get hit Mm -hmm. with one exposure, but you can't say that with four generations. So they generally carry these experiments out to four generations. And that's what you find. You find in rats and in these fish, you find a dramatic decline in fertility. And it's really problematic because we're seeing that in America. I mean, there's, like about a 15% uh, decline in fertility. And it's not people that don't want to have kids. It's people that want to have kids and they're struggling. And that, mm-hmm. it keeps setting new records every single year. For well, people. the average male testosterone, total testosterone count That's nowadays is too. literally cut in half from At what least. it was like 50 years ago or something. It, ex- exactly. Even since the 80s. It's, since it's the 1980s, just it's cut in half. Yeah, it used to be an average of 500 but even before that, when we first started testing testosterone in the 1920s, I mean, the, the average levels were six, 700, up to 800. And if you look at the paleo records of the bone structures, the testosterone was even higher. It's probably 1,500. And it's, you know, you can, so there's an argument to made bringing the grains in, probably cut it from 1,600 down to 800. And then we maintained a pretty good level of 800. And then we, and again, this is epigenetic too. So, you know, you think, well, let me just cut the grains and I'll be up to 1600 on my testosterone for men. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a nice. few generations <laughs> that it takes to, to get to those types of things. But if you can, with our exposures these days of all these estrogens. So that's one of the problems, right? You got the fertility, we've got uh, testo- we got hormone imbalances, low testosterone from these chemicals. Um, you know, you see depression increasing with these chemical exposures. So for example, children that have higher levels of BPA in their urine, much higher levels of depression and children shouldn't even have depression. Yeah. And phthalates in their urine, same thing. So there's a lot of real striking and really common health problems that you see when you increase estrogen exposures. And then of course the question is, well, what are the estrogens, right? Like I keep mentioning BPA, but there's unfortunately a lot more of them and Mm -hmm. plastics are notorious for having those because you know what they do is they play the shell game where it's like oh it's bpa free but then they're putting bps in there or bpf or bpaf and before i wrote my book nobody knew about those analogs i couldn't believe it when i was i didn't know about it even you know when when i was writing my book i kind of came across research on bpa analogs Mm -hmm. 
And for somebody who's not a chemist, they probably don't even know what the word analog means, but it just basically means a molecule is very similar, but not the same. So like if, if you make a testosterone analog, you'd call it trend balone or something, mm -hmm. right? Like you can make steroids that are look like, look like testosterone to your body, but they stay in your body longer, you know? So now they're acting, you know, more, more potently. So something like, you know, something like a athlete might use in, in a certain situation or whatever. Um, it, you know, that's steroids. Same thing with these fake estrogens. They do that. They do this with these plastic chemicals. So you can make BPA illegal and then they'll go and use BPF. Well, the studies showed, and these were new studies when I was publishing my book, BPF is just as bad as BPA. Yeah. BPS, just as bad as BPA, if not worse. And so they're switching from these bad estrogens to worse estrogens or at least as bad estrogens. And then of course you get the phthalates. So there's so many chemicals in the plastics. You've got the personal care products. I think the big, those are the big hitters. I think the plastics and then the personal care products. If you want like two really simple categories where you're going to find a ton of estrogens and you want to fix those in your environment, overhaul your personal care. You know, you don't want just cheap fragrances. You don't want, if you, if you're in doubt, just get Fragrance-free deodorant, get fragrance-free laundry detergent, fragrance-free shampoo, whatever. If you're in doubt, go fragrance-free. If you're not, you know, if you trust the company, get the fragrances. They're, they're cool. You know, like the essential oils have a lot of anti-inflammatory properties and things. But you better trust the company because a lot of companies sneak a lot of shenanigans in, the, in their products. Did you look at that um, scent blocker shampoo that we were using at the oh, farm? Yeah. Was yeah. there stuff in there? No, no, that's fragrance-free. So, yeah, it's fragrance-free, but is it like anything in there at all that's... Yeah. Not, not so good. Brandon brought that, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. I mean, I didn't look at it that closely. Yeah. I mean, people, like, like with people, nobody looks at the, just as people don't really look at the ingredient list on their foods, mm -hmm. nobody looks at the ingredient list on their personal care products. Mm -hmm. And that has a significantly longer list than what's on the food more, more often mm -hmm. than not. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's just like crazy, man. Like I started <laughs> going, it's all chemicals. It's like nothing it is, is non-chemical. It is. That's the problem is most people that don't have a chemistry background, they don't understand all these fancy terms like polyethylene glycol and polypropylene glycol and what's the difference between just those two things or whatever. And then when there's 50 of them lined up in a row, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a problem. And there's obviously different, I mean, thankfully your genetics are excellent for dealing with these estrogens. A lot of people aren't. So there's genetic variation <clears throat> for how people's bodies respond. And you see that in real life. I mean, some people can use certain soaps and then other people use those and they have a reaction to them or they get dry skin. And, you know, they have inflammation from the darn soap. Yeah. And they think, <clears throat> well, I'll cover that up with lotion or something instead of getting to the root cause, which is just get rid of that particular soap. And usually simpler is better, you know, for these ingredients. If you, if you don't know all the chemistry terms and you're not sure about it, just get it, you know, get some simple like beef tallow soap or something yeah. like that. And keep in mind, we're not, I mean, I know you know this, but we're not plants. Yeah. And a lot of people think like, oh, I want plant soap. Like for some reason, there's this weird idea, like we want coconut derived soap or something. It's like, well, you're not a coconut. Cows are much more similar to humans. So if you take beef tallow and you make soap out of it, well, it would make sense that that would probably be more like your body and then olive oil soap or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, you know, again, I don't have a problem with olive oil soap or plant derived soaps, but some people have problems with that in terms of their skin, in terms of just dry skin or irritation or whatever. And, you know, if you want to, if you have issues with that, those are irrespective issues. That those are different issues than having problems with estrogen fragrances, but go more towards the animal products, the saturated fats and things. That's what you have in your body. So don't let anybody tell you saturated fat is bad. It's Something well, that your body has. I mean, the skin is your largest organ. So, like, mm -hmm. what you're applying topically to that is going to have an absorption. I mean, a lot of the uh, testosterone stuff is, is just topical stuff. A lot mm -hmm. of the hormone stuff mm -hmm. is just topical. Yep. So, like, it obviously works. Your body absorbs it and, and makes use of it. So, if you're putting that on as a, you know, heavily fragranced lotion or soap, mm -hmm. your body's absorbing that and doing something with it as well. Exactly. And sunscreen is a good example of that, too, because <clears throat> when I published my book, I told everybody, look, oxybenzone is terrible for you. It's a benzophenone. And I have like, a, that's one of my top 10 in my top 10 list. So I have a top 10 list of fake estrogens you want to avoid. Not only do you want to avoid them, most people are exposed to them every day. Mm -hmm. 
it's not like Agent Orange. I mean, Agent Orange totally screws up your hormones and it screws up your epigenetics, by the way. So if like your grandparents were exposed to Agent Orange or something, you might have some health issues that are residual from that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. But hopefully you're not exposed to Agent Orange every day, but you're probably exposed to plastics every day and these fragrances and sunscreens. And again, benzophenone makes that list of daily exposures. Why? Because we're not, not everybody's putting sunscreen on every day, but oftentimes they sneak sunscreen chemicals into your shampoo. And into like female makeup and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the makeup. And they sunscreen. brag about it. Yeah. And they brag about it. And they'll say like, it's better for your skin or it protects you from UV or it protects your hair from UV or even your clothing from UV. They put them, they put sunscreen chemicals in people's clothing, uh, in their laundry detergent. Mm-hmm. And they've even done studies on this. It's crazy. There's so many studies out there. They do what's called dermal uptake studies. Dermal meaning skin. It's mm-hmm. just a fancy ass way of saying skin, <laughs> skin uptake. Scientists like to sound fancy. Um, but they literally just wash clothes in these, you know, these conventional laundry detergents and put them on people and test their blood. And sure enough, it spikes up their oxybenzone mm. compared to if you don't have those chemicals. And where I was going with this is when I published my book, I told everybody, look, these are bad. They act like estrogen. That's enough for me to say, let's at least be cautious. Let's just avoid it. We don't need more estrogen. We got enough soy and we got enough personal care product estrogens. We got enough plastics in our environment. We don't want another estrogen. Mm-hmm. But after I published my book, pretty close to af- right after, they did a study where they put sunscreen on people, one application, and of course it has oxybenzone, almost all of them do. And by the way, there's good sunscreen with zinc. You don't have to get oxybenzone sunscreen. One application of sunscreen they put on people, seven days later, their blood levels were still above the government's own safety limit for oxybenzone. <laughs> and the government's safety limit is a joke. Yeah. Meaning it's it should be much more stringent. Is it like the higher the SPF rating, the more oxygen? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. If, if they have oxy in there. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is the government, they do what's called toxicity studies, right? Like the NIH and a lot of these professional scientists, they're interested in toxicity. So they say, well, it's all about the dose. Dose. You've probably heard this dose makes the poison thing. Mm-hmm. It's a common thing for conventional thinking scientists to say and i don't honestly agree with it because the dose makes the poison is based on research that looks at cell death all you're looking at is cell death so you have a dish it's a little circular petri dish and you grow cells in there human cells you can take skin cells or liver cells or whatever like liver is usually used because of detoxing Mm -hmm. you know that's where you're breaking these things down let's see if it kills liver cells right maybe let's try some brain cells try a bunch of different types of cells they're growing in liquid you can't have them dried out so you put this fake blood in there and then you put bpa you put phthalates you put oxybenzone you put chemicals in there and you say let's see chocolate right cocoa it doesn't matter you put caffeine in there let's see what it takes to kill these cells and then you make this thing called an ld50 you make this mm-hmm. little graph and 50 percent of them are dead here and 100 percent are dead here and and then they say well it should be good if you're you know, way down here on the curve. If, if you're only using a low dose, you're not killing any cells, you're safe, right? So they make these safety profiles and they have all these equations and it looks all fancy. But the problem with that is BPA looks like estrogen to your cells. Uh, oxybenzone from sunscreen looks like estrogen. Phthalates look like estrogen. You know, this red 40, the red food coloring, these fake red dyes look like estrogen. So your cells are like, hey, that's just estrogen. That's not toxic. It's not cyanide. It's not something that's going to kill. So they, they accept the cells are very accepted, accepting to a very high dose of BPA. So it doesn't appear toxic at all, but it's certainly not optimal. It's terrible for your hormones and for your health, but that's a different thing, right? So it, sure. It doesn't usually cause cancer because it takes a damn high dose to cause cancer Mm -hmm. because you're not screwing with the DNA too. You're not like cutting up the DNA. It's not toxic, right? But the problem with that sunscreen study, what they found is it's even the one application of sunscreen pushes you into that cancer causing level Mm. seven days later. So, and and it gets worse, right? Because that's not the only estrogen you're exposed to. If you're putting on oxybenzone sunscreen and that was it, it's like, that's not good for you, but that's it. Well, you're, that's not it because you're drinking out of plastic bottles. You know, you know, everybody's putting on fragrances and, and their deodorants got the fragrances and just on and on with the fragrances. 
And so you're adding, it's additive. Mm -hmm. It's one plus one plus one. Eventually you got 10. Now you've got exposures to 10 estrogens in your system every day. And it's, it gets even worse. <laughs> your body accumulates these things. You don't, you usually don't just flush them out. Just like natural hormones, your body stores them up in fat. Like for the reason we know this is because, you know, just from a common sense perspective, if you take some butter and you put it in a glass of water, it floats. It doesn't, you know, it, it's hydrophobic. It's a fear of water. Mm -hmm. Well, horm sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, all these pregnant alone, they're made from cholesterol. Right. So think of butter. Butter's full of cholesterol. It's very fatty. It floats on water. Guess what testosterone does? Guess what estrogen does? They float on water and meaning they store in fat. So which would they prefer? Would they prefer to stay on your skin or go in the water? Well, they prefer to stay on your skin. Your skin is fatty, right? If you've ever eaten chicken skin, you would know it's fatty. Doctors say don't eat chicken skin, which is by the way, nonsense. But the reason doctors oftentimes will tell you that is because they want you on a low fat diet. Again, mm -hmm. nonsense. But it's because chicken fat is very fatty. Your skin or chicken skin is very fatty. You know, your skin is very fatty. It's just the, the nature of that skin cell. So when you rub fatty things on like fake hormones or real hormones on your skin, they go through because it's fat and they store in your fat. So if you've got fat and everybody does um, inside your body, you know, around your organs, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, you're storing these fake estrogens. So it's accumulating. And they've done studies on polar bears and they found, they did a study in Northern Alaska with 11 polar bears and every single one of them had parabens, which again, fragrances, plastics, parabens in their fat and in their liver. Just from them being own. in the water? No, just from them eating the, the seals. Mm. So the seals are eating the sardines and the sardines are basically getting the exposure probably. So it's probably working up the food chain from the ocean currents. Mm. So our oceans are so damn polluted and they were looking at parabens because there's not as many parabens in the plastic. So of course there's tons of phthalates in our oceans because we've got literally like an Island of the size of Texas out in, you know, off the coast of California, they call it the great Pacific garbage patch. Um, and most of that's coming from China, but I mean, we're not, we're pretty, we're shipping our garbage over there. So then they dump the garbage in the ocean. It's a ridiculous system, but, um, but of course you'd expect a lot of phthalates because the main, you know, the, the main structure of that great Pacific gar garbage patch is plastic. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're wrecking our oceans with this stuff, but then the parabens we're just flushing down the, you know, the, the sink when, when we're taking a shower and whatever else. And of course that ultimately ends up in the ocean. So there's a real problem, as you can imagine with the, all these estrogen chemicals in our exposures. With the, with the water supply, is that something that gets filtered out through the natural water cycle, you know, mm -hmm. condensation, evaporation, like rainwater, is that totally clean or, or not so mm -hmm. much? It's pretty clean. Yeah. I mean, they found microplastics in some of these Colorado, these, like if you Google microplastics, Colorado remote Lake, mm -hmm. you'll find all kinds of research in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, they're finding microplastics. So it's clearly coming down in the rain to some degree, but it's not like a harmful level necessarily, but I still think, people should filter their drinking water irregardless because there's a lot of other shenanigans in there. But in the city water and the municipal water, they don't even try and remove these fake estrogens like BPA and phthalates and whatnot because they're small. They're like little hormones. They're not bacteria. Bacteria are big. Bacteria are living cells. Viruses are big. They're not as big as bacteria, but they're pretty big. And so they're great at filtering out viruses and bacteria in the municipal water system but they're terrible at filtering out these little hormones and things. So you've got to do it yourself. And the way to do it is just activate charcoal. Yeah. If your filter has activated charcoal, sometimes they call it carbon. You're good. And that's a huge priority. Filter the drinking water. Don't put it back into plastics. A lot of people buy plastic pitchers, you know, and mm -hmm. so they filter the drinking water, they do the right thing. And then they, they put flip it into the plastic. <laughs> yeah. I got one of those big old stainless steel Berkey filters. Mm -hmm. and that's been my go-to. Yeah. I need to get, you get the whole system in your house, like integrated into the house. So mm -hmm. I, I need to get that for the, for the house because it's it great. Everything easy. Well, and I've got, I mean, remember I've got all these kids, I got five kids. So I used to do the giant Berkey at my house, but then you're refilling it like mm -hmm. nonstop. It's literally like, you might as well just sit in there and buy the pitcher and <laughs> fill it all day. So I got a reverse osmosis uh, system that's stainless steel. Nice. It's the only one I know of that doesn't have a big plastic tank underneath your sink. And 
you know, because the problem with those big plastic tanks, apparently, I'm mean, number one, it's plastic. Yeah. That's the first thing. But number two, those tanks apparently are cesspools for bacterial growth. Mm. So now they're trying to develop technology with UV light in there and stuff mm-hmm. to kill the bacteria. But then you're actually leaching even more estrogen from the plastic. If you're because shining light, UV yeah. light, you're breaking down more plastic into your water. So Which is what happens when people drink out of a water bottle that's been sitting on the dash all day long. Exactly. The heat and the UV exacerbate leaching. Mm-hmm. Right? And by the way, so does oily stuff. So if you store your olive oil in plastic, it's terrible. You get a lot more leaching than if you have water in plastic because it's oily and these estrogens like oil. Right? Mm-hmm. We talked about that. It's hydrophobic. So... <clears throat> You know, they don't necessarily like to go into water. They'll go into water, but not as much as they'll go into oil. And this is really one of the causes of a lot of confusion with fats and research on fats in science, because you'll find a study that says olive oil is great for you. And then you'll find a study that says olive oil is terrible for you. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually doing these studies, you realize these darn researchers, some of them are using good quality olive oil they're buying from the store. And it's in glass jars and they're not even telling you this in the studies. You can read through all the details and they won't tell you the, like the brand or the source or whatever. Cause they just call it olive oil. They say like, we used olive oil. Well, a lot of them are buying plastic tubs of olive oil or big plastic jars. And so they're really a lot of times studying the, da- the damaging effects of the fake estrogens that they that, ha- that olive oil has or some of these fats have. And it's hard to kind of distinguish between all that stuff. Yeah. It's like when you start going on that rabbit hole, man, it's like, mind boggling how many mm. things you need to swap out for and just to prove mm. upon. And mm. I don't feel like you want to obsess about it at the point where like it's mm. cutting into your daily life. Right. Like we went to the farm and it made sense to have plastic water bottles because mm-hmm. it just made sense. It was a short or term traveling. thing. Exactly. Or traveling. But like on a day to day basis, having things kind of, you know, hedging the bets in your favor. Like I swapped out all my plastic Tupperwares, mm-hmm. which I'm heating in the microwave exactly. to glass and mm-hmm. Pyrex. So less issues there. Yep. Um, all of my cooking stuff is now glass or Pyrex or stainless. It's just like, like most people don't think mm-hmm. that this would have a profound impact, but if you do it every single day, it compounds over time. Exactly. I mean, you see how high estrogen levels are and how low testosterone levels are. So it's obviously accumulating somewhere. Exactly. And men and women too. I know I always talk about men when I talk about testosterone levels and that's because I'm a man and I'm more familiar with the numbers, but I mean, women's testosterone has been tanking also and it gets underreported because they didn't even research women's testosterone. Like in the 1980s, we know the male's testosterone levels. They to- they couldn't care less about women, dude. Like they never studied them until like the 90s to 2000s. They weren't even looking at their testosterone, which is pathetic because it's incredibly important. Women that, that have low testosterone and they take a little bit of cream and they bump their levels up, especially post-menopause is usually when you see this. They feel amazing. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, that's the only difference that they did. And now their metabolism went up, their sex drive went up, their energy went up, their mood mm-hmm. dramatically improved. Well, the, that's clearly something that people should be paying attention to then. Um, and, you know, the sad thing with women's testosterone. So men, we talked about the range. Like I like to see men above 500. Mm-hmm. That's simply got to be at least above 500. Let's and that's be honest. for all ages? Yeah, well, after you're 18 or whatever. I mean, not like a 10-year-old, but... Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. And, it, and by the way, it's a myth. People that say testosterone declines with age is actually a myth. Um, you know, they say like, I have a testosterone of an 80-year-old man. <laughs> and it's actually not true. That The reason people say that is because <clears throat> when they were studying declining testosterone, they didn't realize it was declining in everybody. It was declining in the 18-year-olds too. Mm. And it was declining in the 50-year-olds and the 80-year-olds, but they were just looking at the 50-year-olds and saying... Well, we tracked you when you were 50, you were here, and now you're 80 and you're here. Just and it went down. All the estrogens. But if you were 18 and you, now you're 20 or 30 or f- f- whatever, it went down also at the same rate. Yeah. And they've done larger studies and proven that. that not, it's not age necessarily. I mean, it goes down a little bit with age, but it's surprising how little it goes down. It'll go from like 800 to 760 or something. Yeah. It's not like 800 to 400 like people have in their minds. I mean, the free testosterone goes down a little bit more too. So that's another factor. But <clears throat> the point is, it's not necessarily age. It's everybody going down. And when you get below 500, it's a disaster. I think you have to be above 500 men. Women, the normal range for women's testosterone is about 20 to, uh, well, it's actually about, usually on blood tests, it's about five to, or se- let's say seven to 70, mm-hmm. which is a silly range, right? That's a tenfold difference. You're adding a zero. Yeah. Seven to 70. 
And what's even worse, unfortunately, you know how there's different lab testing companies, like there's LabCorp and there's Quest all got Diagnostics. Different parameters exactly. Healthy, yeah. Exactly. And some of those blood testing companies, they'll say zero to 70 is the normal range for women's testosterone. So in other words, if you go into the, you know, the doctor and you get a testosterone check and you're, you're a woman and your testosterone comes out as zero, they won't even flag. They won't flag it. They'll say everything's normal and your blood test looks good. And if you're not actively looking at your labs, you would just assume you've got good testosterone. You added that to the blood test, mm -hmm. which is a good, good thing to do for women because they wouldn't, you know, you almost have to fight to have it added to the blood test because they're not even going to check it. So you got it tested. The doctor told you it's fine. You look at the actual number. It's a freaking zero. Yeah. And, that, and then you're like, that's weird. My blood tests are coming out so good because I've got depression and I've got no sex drive and I've got no energy. <laughs> right. That's so confusing. It, you know, like it must be something extra. Well, I, not only do I think 70 to or seven to 70 is off. I mean, the, the normal range should at least be, like I say, like 20, pro mm -hmm. probably, preferably closer to 50. I mean, with sex hormones in general, you just want to be on the higher end of the range. Right. It's that simple. If you don't understand all the units and all the ranges, because if you're in the UK, the units are different. If you're in Australia, the units are different. You want to be on the high end of normal. Yeah, nothing should be zero. <laughs> that for sure that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hormones is a funny thing, man. Like so many people, they look to exogenous sources for the hormones, but they don't realize how much of an impact like sleep quality, for instance, mm. has on their sex hormones. And, I mean, mm -hmm. if you have terrible sleep, like all of your numbers are going to be cut in half as well. I mean, whenever I do a competition prep, my testosterone drops in half, mm -hmm. uh, much less so now that I'm doing a high dietary fat approach because I've got more cholesterol coming into my diet, mm -hmm. which is a precursor to testosterone, for yep. instance. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, like people... They're always looking for external factors to improve instead of just fixing their diet, their lifestyle factors, their sleep and whatnot. Yeah. And that's going to have a profound effect on everything. Well, I'm glad you brought, brought up cholesterol too because I think that has to be brought up because there's so much nonsense in the cholesterol world. And I think we, we even talked about this a little bit on the just the last podcast in the DNA because it, it relates to heart disease and all this supposedly. But And I, if people are interested... You know, I did a YouTube video on cholesterol and what's the optimal range versus what doctors will tell you the optimal range is. It's a totally different thing mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I've had people tell me that my cholesterol is good, which just usually to me, that means my cholesterol is low. Mm -hmm. If a doctor is telling you your cholesterol, it looks really good. 90 times out of 100, 9 out of 10 times, that means your cholesterol is very low. <laughs> Which Why? is bad for your sex hormone level. Yeah, it's bad for everything. I mean, like exactly. from a neurological standpoint, it's not optimal. Your brain um, has a ton of cholesterol. I mean, mm -hmm. every cell in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So like... Especially your brain though, man. Yeah. The brain's what, 20% of total cholesterol? It's closer to cholesterol 30. Or something like that. 20, yeah. 30. Yeah, if you dehydrate um, the water. Mm -hmm. So why why is this narrative constantly been... Uh, lower cholesterol, lower cholesterol. Because they sell more statins. They sell but, more statins, and they're just so quick to prescribe the statins. They'll, they'll not even mm -hmm. check the other. They'll not even check the particle size. They'll mm -hmm. just simply mm -hmm. prescribe a statin based off of a simple lipid panel of Triggs, mm -hmm. HDL, and LDL, which is just not a full scope. Yeah, but it's a key component to this discussion because if your cholesterol is low, meaning good according yeah. to most doctors, which again I consider that low, and you and I've had people like this where they're their testosterone will be 300 <clears throat> and they're sleeping good. You know, they're, they're, they're avoiding all the fake estrogens. And they're saying, look, I'm doing all this stuff. What's your cholesterol? Oh, it's 150 or it's 130 or something crazy. And I'll tell them, look, you need to just throw out those egg whites and eat like 10 egg yolks a day for a couple weeks and retest. And it'll jump to 600 just from that, just from pumping in some cholesterol, giving your body the building block for testosterone and testosterone it's complicated like that. You know, it's not just estrogens. It's not just cholesterol. It's not just sleep. It's all of those. Mm -hmm. It might be a magnesium deficiency. It might be too many heavy metals. That's another common one that I see for low. So some people have genetic risks for not clearing heavy metals from their liver. So it's usually related to glutathione, by the way. Um, and, you know, they're eating a lot of seafood or whatever. They're getting too many heavy metals. And it's, that's the root cause of low. And by the way, you know, these supplements that have all these metals not necessarily heavy metals, but like nickel and cobalt and chromium and cadmium. And, you know, you've seen these multivitamins. They have these long lists mm -hmm. of all these metals. Those lower testosterone, most people don't realize almost every single one of those, if you isolate them and you do a study and compare head to head, they lower testosterone, except for calcium, except for magnesium. Those are metals. Um, 
Is it just binding zinc. to the free test or what's, what's no, happening? No, it just, there? it probably just messes. I mean, I'm not totally sure, first of all, but zinc, calcium, and magnesium are all involved in producing testosterone. Mm-hmm. It's not a simple process either. You know, like when your body makes cholesterol from fatty acids, it's literally like a 30 step process. It's super complicated. And all those enzymes, those 30 different enzymes that are involved in making it, they require metals like calcium and magnesium and zinc. And if you're displacing those metals with, with, uh, you know, aluminum or, uh, nickel, right. And by the way, you need a little bit of nickel, but not a lot. If you're displacing with too much nickel in your system, that downgrades the ability to make that Mm -hmm. cholesterol or make that testosterone. And, um, and so a lot of people are misguided taking all of these extra minerals all the time. Well, you most get, multivitamins have a lot of what you don't need and a little of what you do need. Correct. Or I haven't found a single versions, lovely yeah. <laughs> multivitamin that really been great. Oh, yeah. And again, a lot of people are actually lowering their testosterone from that angle, especially if their genetics are poor for dealing with heavy metals. So another factor, right? Like you want to hit all the factors. You don't want to just think, well, it's just about estrogens or it's just about sleep or it's, and I know you don't, I'm just saying like a lot of people tend to want to simplify it. Our brains t- go there. They want to yeah. oversimplify it. And you want the more angles that you can hit it from and the more boxes you can check off to say, I've got that covered. I've got good sleep. I've got, I've got the drinking water filtered. I've got this. The more you can do that in our culture, the better your overall health is going to be. You're going to be happier. You're going to have more energy. You're going to have more sex drive. I mean, it's noticeable. Um, and by the way, testosterone really modulates your epigenetics to kind of come, come full circle on that because, and all the sex hormones do. And the reason for that, and I apologize if I'm monologuing a little too no, much. No, no, you're good. You're good. I'm learning. <laughs> but when you have a cell, it has a membrane, right? And it's like a pillowcase. You know, your pillow's got a pillowcase. It's got a membrane around it. Well, most hormones, they don't go into your cell. They just stick to the outside. Like insulin sticks to the insulin receptor on the outside and then has an impact on the inside. It's mm-hmm. like a, it, it, it doesn't even go in there. It doesn't go into the cell. Um, growth hormone, same thing, right? All these, all kinds of different things. Um, some hormones, though, they'll go into that pillowcase. They'll go inside the cell before they do anything, right? And they'll have actions inside the cell. Um, whether that's to make more proteins or signal the cell to make more proteins and, or whatever the thing is. But testosterone, not only does it go into the cell, which again, that sets it apart, right? Now now it's suddenly an elite hormone, if you call it that, because now it's inside the cell. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, sex hormones go into the nucleus. And most people don't realize because they're not studying this stuff every day. The nucleus is where your DNA is. They know that. Everybody knows that. But your nucleus has a membrane. It has another membrane. So you have another pillowcase inside your cell. Mm-hmm. It's a double pillowcase. In the nuclear membrane, almost nothing goes in there because your cells can't have a bunch of nonsense bullshit going into the nucleus and wrecking your DNA. So the nuclear membrane is very stringent. It's very hard to get through. Sex hormones go through that and they act directly on your DNA. So of course they're going to alter your epigenetics really dramatically. Most things don't. Um, so the sex hormones are one of the maybe probably the biggest lever and modulator of uh, epigenetics because they're right in there. Mm. They're getting dirty in the trenches in your DNA. So you want to change your epigenetics the fastest, you change your hormones. That should be their focus, right? Um, And like I say, sleep, all this other stuff, it all helps your epigenetics. If you're doing it right, if you're sleeping good, good quality, and you're getting enough sleep, you're eating healthy, you're getting enough minerals and vitamins and not too much of heavy metals and all this other stuff. I mean, that all helps because, but it helps in different ways, but it especially helps because it helps your sex hormones balance. So if someone's listening to the first podcast that they're, they're going to get like a genetic test and get all the raw data and, and mm-hmm. dive into that mm-hmm. from like a blood hormone standpoint, uh, blood panel standpoint, both lipids and hormones and just any other markers, are there like some good, you know, tests that people should, well, I, what I typically recommend doing is, is every six months, at least every year getting a full plan, a panel done, just kind of see what your markers are, mm-hmm. um, kind of proactively, but like top of your mind, what are some tests that people should mm-hmm. be sure to add to their list? Yeah. Well, blood sugar, it's amazing how many people don't check their blood sugar. And it's so silly because it's, it's $30 finger pricking tool at Walmart. You know? Yeah. It's called that glucometer. 
at least check your blood sugar and make yeah. sure it's fasted in the morning. Get a get an idea and make sure you're below 85. Uh, vitamin D, if you're low on vitamin D, your testosterone will be lower than it should be. Make sure your vitamin D is above 50. Get it checked. It's amazing how many doctors ignore that. They don't check it. Um, you know, I would check triglycerides. I'm interested in that usually, but but um, and I am also interested in total cholesterol. And if that's outrageously high, then let's start talking about particles and all this stuff. But and, and all of this is genetic. You know, there's variability in people's genetics. But yeah, what, what is crazy high in your opinion? Above three. Well, the crazy high is like 500 right. or something. But if it's above 300, that's when I'm, that's where I draw the line in the sand and say, okay, you're too high now. So if maybe if they might be too high. 250, but for instance, that's great. They probably shouldn't be on a statin. Definitely shouldn't be on a statin. Shouldn't even be worried about it. Yeah. Um, and now if they're trig- if they're 250 on their total cholesterol and their triglycerides are 250, well, let's worry about that. Triglycerides. I worry about that. You need to do more cardio and you need to, uh, eat less carbs. <laughs> those yeah. are the two main things. But yeah, man, like the, the, those are some of the ones. And yours, based on your genetics, it was Billy Rubin. You got to keep checking that. That's custom to you. Yeah. Most people, they don't need to pay attention to that. Some people, it's iron. They need to be checking their iron pretty regularly. A lot of people, it's, uh, you know, like, well, the sex hormone. Testosterone, men and women, everybody should be checking that at least once or twice, once in a while. You don't have to check that every year. If you're a bodybuilder or something, you should, but... You know, I don't think you have to keep checking it all the time because they'll, you'll see a pattern after a while. And if you're not changing anything dramatically, you don't have to keep checking it. But what about blood pressure? I feel like a lot of people, mm. you know, like you go to the Walmarts and there's yeah. blood pressure devices there for people to just sit in and, and get checked. Is there, is that something that people should do proactively? Just kind of yeah. see what their markers are there? Yeah. I mean, every once in a while, if you have a tendency to be high, then I would pay a lot of attention to it. It definitely damages your arteries. If you're, if you get too much pressure in there, it, it can damage your arteries, but that's again, a genetic thing. So most people don't have those genes. It's not that big of a deal. Most people that do have those genes, they kind of know it already because it runs in their family and they should be checking it. Yeah. And it, honestly though, exercise really helps. I mean, yeah. people aren't exercising and then they wonder why their blood sugar is high. Uh, bl- blood blood pressure. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I've had several people that will, that they'll, they'll talk to me about what their doctors have recommended and they'll have, you know, cholesterol over 200 and slightly elevated blood pressure. And that to them, to their doctors mm-hmm. is like the recipe for having to be on a statin, mm-hmm. but they don't exercise or anything like that. It's mm-hmm. like, well, you got to get, you got to get that fixed up first. Yeah. Got to do it. I mean, and it makes your blood sugar so much better. You know, you're more sensitive to insulin decreases inflammation overall. Sure. It temporarily spikes your inflammation a little bit. But but it's kind of like a hormetic effect. Like it ends up being positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man, I think that's about it. I mean, usually it's it's really simple. You don't have to check all of these blood tests all the time. Unless, you, again, if you switch from a high-carb diet and then you clean up and you get healthy and you, and you do a, a more keto-based diet, higher protein, animal foods, well, yeah, let's check your blood sugar maybe like once a year, once every six months for a while just to see. Mm-hmm. But after doing that diet for a while, it's just going to come back to like your cholesterol. Like for me, I'm usually about 240 to 260 on my cholesterol every year. Yeah. It's like, why do, why would I even bother keep checking? I'm not doing anything different. Now, of yeah. course I am hunting pretty hard sometimes and doing some other stuff that sometimes disrupts the numbers a little bit. But I mean, I know that. And so it doesn't surprise me, but you know, I don't, I don't have to keep obsessing over it. Yeah. For once me, you have a sense of it. I'll check on a, annual basis because like I'll be in a building phase where mm-hmm. I'm in a pretty significant caloric surplus versus a cutting phase. Right. And I'm just curious to see what those different phases, you know, have an impact on mm-hmm. <clears throat> because like that can have a pretty profound impact. If you're in a much of a caloric surplus, you're going to have far different markers mm-hmm. than you would at a deficit mm-hmm. uh, from a lipid panel and from a hormone panel. Um, so that I'm curious to see what those numbers are, but most people aren't doing that as well. So, right. Yeah, that's why it requires some coaching and stuff usually because everybody's situation is different and it's really hard to make like a global, like, oh, everybody should do this or everybody should do that. Um, I mean, if there was one global supplement I'd lean towards, it's probably magnesium and vitamin D. Yeah. Magnesium tends to be very deficient in most people. And unfortunately, the blood tests for magnesium are terrible. Mm -hmm. And they do them sometimes. They'll do these red blood cell magnesium tests that just tells you what's floating around your blood. It doesn't help yeah. you much building up in your body and in your bones and inside your cells and all this kind of stuff where most magnesium is. And what they do for the gold standard magnesium test is 
it's it's called like a flush where you you take magnesium or like a pulse and you take a certain amount of magnesium and you see how much you and they, they test your urine and see how much you're peeing out mm. because if your body is desperately deficient you'll just like absorb all that magnesium because your body's like all right we finally got some but if you got plenty already built up in your cells and everything you'll just pee most of it out and so they can tell how much you're urinating out how deficient you are, but nobody's doing that in a, in like a normal day to day clinical yeah. blood test because it's complicated. It's a pain. But you'd be the, uh, when they do those tests, when they do those research studies, I should say, they find most people are deficient. Yeah, didn't you say it was like some seventy plus seventy percent or mm-hmm. something insane like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done the uh, like hair follicle test oh, yeah. to see where I'm deficient nice. from a, a mineral standpoint, mm-hmm. and that was pretty insightful. Mm-hmm. Uh, upgraded formulas has like a hair analysis test that I did, yeah. uh, but I would heavy, imagine do they have heavy metals on there too? Or yeah, it's heavy metal. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it's heavy metals, uh, minerals, electrolytes, all mm-hmm. that stuff. Nice, um, and they're super. Like I get a lot of my potassium supplements and everything from them because they they're just a solid company Mm -hmm. but uh yeah electrolytes is one that people don't really Mm -hmm. on keto i feel like the the community is kind of wise and up to the importance of that and they're more apt to take in sodium potassium magnesium calcium at ample doses but most people aren't uh of course most people also on a lot of carbs they're not excreting as much of it either Mm -hmm. um but yeah you got to get those out of them yeah definitely yeah well what's on the pipeline for you man What, what do you got coming up I don't know. You, you mentioned well, a few things on our trip. I don't want to. I don't want to put any secrets out there yet. So I don't know what you're privy to share. Oh man! I, I mean, well, I just told you today that I got invited to speak at KetoCon. Heck so yeah. for people that are on the fence about coming, you know, come. It's going to be a fun time. It's in Austin, I believe. Yep, right? You're yep. you're going to be a speaker there too. Yep, I'll so. be speaking. It's in July. I think. Yeah, it's year. it's quite a ways out. You got some time to plan it out. Yep. It's in Austin, Texas as it was the, the other time I was there and uh, man, it's a fun group of people uh, and it's a great city, great conference. So good barbecue. Oh man. <laughs> Terry blacks right across the street yeah. from the Palmer event center. So that's coming up. Thank um, you. You got any books or anything coming up? In the I hope so. Gee, you hope so. That's one of the, pl- that's one of the major plans here. I got to do some books. I've got a lot of them. I've got a lot of insight into stem cells because I did years of research at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota on stem cells and upgrading. How do you upgrade? Because I, I was approaching it from when I was researching stem cells, my own interest is like, well, I, you know, <laughs> I want to figure out stem cells and understand them better and understand how to upgrade them and increase them. And that's a whole other podcast basically, but, and it's a book, you know, I need to re- really sit down and, and write that book because uh, it's a really interesting topic. I don't think people need to be running out and injecting stem cells, but if they do, you know, there's nuance there. There's a major difference. Like for example, just as a really brief uh, preview, most Americans have what I call McDonald's stem cells. They're eating a McDonald's, they're eating a bunch of junk and their stem cells are junk. The epigenetics in those stem cells are junk. So if you isolate stem cells from those people and then you re-inject them into your knee or whatever, you're injecting McDonald's stem cells, they're junk. Yeah. But if you take stem cells from Robert Sykes, right? Phenomenal bodybuilder, natural, no hormones, nothing. Those stem cells are freaking amazing. You know, those are like bodybuilders. If you ever need an extra source of income. Now stem cells are variable and a lot of research doesn't account for that. They just kind of lump it all together. And yeah. there's tons of variability in the studies about how great they are, how bad they are. And there's a lot of natural ways to upgrade stem cells. So that's a book that I need to get cracking on. And I have been, but I need to finish. And I've got a a lot to say about heart disease. I did a PhD on cholesterol. I need to put that together because most heart disease has nothing to do with cholesterol. It's inflammation and it's genetic variants and isolating what those categories are. Like some people, it's high blood sugar. Some people, it's some people, it is cholesterol. Some people's heavy metal. Some people have heart disease from, uh, lectins not everybody you know like Stephen Gundry would kind of just assume everybody does but but there are people and and there's people with hyaluronic acid they have certain genes relating like one is called HABP2 hyaluronic acid binding protein number two if you have those genetic differences it's related to hyaluronic acid of all things people have never heard of this so like there's a book there that I need to work on too it might be a short book I don't want to get way into the nuance and all the details, but people need to know, like 
if they have a risk of heart disease, the doctor is just going to assume it's cholesterol and they're just going to yeah. pretend like everything goes back to cholesterol. And usually it's not. Do Almost you think, always it's something else. Do you think that that uh, pendulum is swinging at all? Like, do you feel like oh, the, the conventional community. doctors are starting to wise up to the fact that it's mm. not all just cholesterol? Do you feel like that's just going to be the narrative continually? I would like to think that the doctors are wising up, but it's the similar topic to like COVID and all this stuff. It's like, you'd like to think that because the information is out there, people would make an adapt, adapt and make like a, a sensible change, but they don't Yeah, <laughs> usually that's what you see. Um, so that, that book needs to be written because I think it will also influence the medical doctors, you know, because then they can have a book that says, look, this is a legit scientist who did a, you know, like a lot of years of research on this exact topic. Um, and it comes, it, it, it like flows nicely with the estrogen stuff because again, cholesterol is related to all these sex hormones. So a lot of stuff, right? I have a lot of stuff up in the air. Um, and mainly I'm focusing on the DNA consulting also. So always busy. Yeah. Always busy, man. And you're doing all this hunting and the videography oh, yeah. with the hunting. Mm -hmm. Um, you got yeah. some exciting things coming up there as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. Pe people that are into hunting need to follow you on your hunting channel, which is yeah, you just, just branched off. Just separated. That. And what, what's that one called? That's called the AJ cast, Anthony J cast, like fishing cast. Mm -hmm. Um, I was trying to do them together. I was doing like just Anthony J on YouTube and had like some science content, had some fishing and hunting content, but my people that were interested, they were interested in the science stuff and they couldn't care less about the hunting <laughs> stuff and vice versa. And it was hurting my channel because YouTube, yeah, they want your, you. they want your followers to actually watch all of your videos, not just half of your videos. Yeah. yeah. So when they only watch half the videos, everything goes down on your metrics on YouTube and it's, it makes you suffer. So I, I just said, all right, fine. I'll just separate them. And unfortunately I dropped one of my hard drives and I lost our hunt last year we had, I hope a lot of your audience had already seen it because it had thousands of views, but I uh, took it off my one YouTube channel and then I went to put it on my other one and I could, and I, it, it turns out it was on the, a hard drive that I had dropped and I had not double backed it up. So I just did a total rookie mistake there. But this year's hunt should be on YouTube coming up soon. So if people actually want to watch us getting out hunting. And it's mostly me, unfortunately, because mostly we're separating. We're going to three different spots. We're not all sitting together in yeah. a tree stand. <laughs> yeah, Wouldn't I'd, make any sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vlog. I probably said this last year, but I'm going to vlog more mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm more or less situated here, I'm going to start mm -hmm. actually picking up the camera a lot more and not doing just the talking head stuff. Mm -hmm. So the next season I hunt, will probably mm -hmm. be a lot more video yeah. content as well. We can just like a collaboration. I'll give you a bunch of my clips and vice versa, and we'll make some pretty cool montage out of it for sure. Yeah. yeah, but It'll be good, man. Yeah. Your, your book, Estro Generation, was written four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. yeah. And that's been wildly popular. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot know. of people have talked about that in high esteem. Um, Thanks, yeah. Yeah, you're making waves, man. I feel like the, the content that you're putting out, when, when that came out, or I guess after it came out a few years, but people got a hold of it in the keto space. And the mm. next thing I know, every single post I saw on Instagram was people throwing out plastic Tupperware and getting mm. glass and stuff. And <laughs> I'm, I'm attributing all that to you. So you're, you're, oh, making, yeah. you're making an impact, man. Yeah, I mean, when I wrote the book, people were only talking about BPA. Mm -hmm. Like, they were talking about it but they were just barely talking about it. And it was just, oh, BPA free. That was all that mattered. And that was all that mattered to me until I started researching. Like I kind of had this idea that these chemicals were out there, but I didn't know exactly which ones they were. And as I got deeper and deeper into this throughout the years, you know, when I was doing my PhD, because again, the hormones I was doing, I was working on that stuff mm -hmm. and it just, it was a rabbit hole. And to try and simplify that for people was important because Here's the thing that I, I came across with, with my book was <laughs> there's a lot of scientists that study phthalates, which are in plastics and they're BPA free, but it's phthalates and they will go out and give talks and they'll say phthalates are terrible for you. Here's why, right? Like, like, like Shauna Swan, right? She was on Joe Rogan's podcast. Phthalates are terrible. Well, there's other people that just only study atrazine, which is a herbicide. And they'll go out and around the country and say, atrazine is terrible. And they give talks at these scientific conferences. And then there's other people that study BPS and they say the same thing. And then there's other people that study red food coloring. They say, you know what I mean? Like the pattern for me was, oh my gosh, why is nobody putting this all together into yeah. one resource that's easy to read so people can actually understand it? And that's what I did there. It wasn't like some heroic thing. It was just me doing something for myself because I was curious about what are all the sources? What are the ones we're exposed to every day? Let's put them together. Yeah. Well, one thing that you and I were talking about last night over dinner uh, was that 
you know, you make things very relatable. You, you try not to, you, you try to open the doors for the general public to come in and assimilate the information you're putting out and apply it to their daily life. So many top tier scientists, medical professionals, and people that create content have this, what you call it, academic pride, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. they intentionally go about mm. creating barriers ob- to entry. Ob- obsc- ob- ob- obscafating? You know, yeah. Ob- they make it, the you know what yeah, I'm talking about? They, they just make everything so obtuse <clears throat> and hard to mm-hmm. comprehend and assimilate. It's just, it just goes one ear and out the other. And I feel like, you know, you've done an exceptionally good job at just taking this really in-depth information, but making it, you know, actionable for people mm-hmm. that don't want to go through 14 years to get their PhD. Um, oh, thanks, and I feel man. like people appreciate that, you know, like people yeah. need that. Yeah, they do. And I appreciate it when other people do it, you know, and like if I'm reading something about physics or something about math or something about engineering you know like regarding my lawnmower or something i don't want some like crazy technical treatise i just want to know the real practical application the thing that i'm that i can actually put into practice and i feel like other people are the same way and you know when i did my phd you're encouraged to go the other direction you're encouraged to make it more complicated more technical it sounds better even they've even done studies on the British accent, you know, like they can say the exact same thing with an accent and you actually sound more academic and you'll do better in academia on these like oral presentations and things, which you're always doing at those when you're getting a higher education. So there's a lot of silliness there, but the worst part is when people get prideful about it and they, they like they basically, they just, that's, that's their whole life, right? Like that, those academic things that it turns into a religion for them and, they refuse to think open-minded about these things and they make it more technical and more complicated. It's not practical. It's frustrating. Yeah. And then, like you said previously as well, like people that have been in it for so long that are in, I mean, they've made an academic career of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they spend more time writing grants and looking for money mm-hmm. than they do to conducting the actual research. So they're not even on the cutting edge of what the, the most up-to-date research is showing. Mm-hmm. So it just becomes this self-perpetuating cycle of not delivering as much value as they potentially could. Mm-hmm. And they do so with their noses up high mm-hmm. to the general public. So mm-hmm. it's just, yeah. it's an exhausting yeah. environment, man. Yeah. No, but I mean, I appreciate podcasts like yours, you know, people, people at least have the access to these types of knowledge bases now. And the information is here. I mean, you're bringing on awesome guests and, and, you know, really have like opening up this giant well of knowledge that people can access thank goodness yeah in yeah i think podcasting medium is freaking awesome man. Mm-hmm. like it's what you're able to do for the people listening is just so much more value add than i can possibly i mean than i could possibly do any other way mm-hmm. uh, and especially the people that are you know on the medical front lines on the scientific back end i mean those that take the time on top of everything they're currently doing to also have a podcast and bring out the information is just hats off to them for sure yeah for sure yeah no. Well, shoot, man, you got a long drive ahead of you. Head to head to head up to Minnesota. Uh, mm-hmm. You're stopping at Kansas tonight, though, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. not too too bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but man, always a pleasure having you out here. Always always fun at the farm. Yeah, uh, we'll do it again next year, brother. Yeah, look forward. Take care, man. Thanks.